welcome to Psychiatry Education Forum's Coffee Club. And topic is Antidepressants Induced Bruxism. And this will be discussed in following five sections. So these sections are actually five questions. First question is, what is bruxism and why is bruxism recognition important? Second is, what is the mechanism behind bruxism with antidepressants use? Third is, which antidepressants can increase the risk of bruxism? Fourth is, who is at high risk of getting bruxism with antidepressant use? And last is, management strategies for antidepressant induced bruxism. So let's begin our coffee club now. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I am Lena Palaniapan and I'm very pleased today to welcome um, Dr. Harvinder Singh, who most of you know already using this website. Dr. Harvinder Singh has been uh, running this educational forum for nearly three years now. Um, he's an excellent orator, excellent speaker, as you all know already. Uh, he's an outpatient psychiatrist working at uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge on uh, clinical practice, which he is distilling over years and providing to us in, uh, uh, as dew drops, so to speak. So today we're going to have one more uh, dew drop of his wisdom. And today we're going to discuss an issue that's very close to his, um, uh, his heart, the side effects of treatments. Uh, and we're going to deal with uh, a, a, a rather unusual side effect, but a rather troublesome side effect, bruxism mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in patients who take uh, antidepressants. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Singh, for uh, being here and answering some of the questions that I have. I have to say, um, I haven't seen a lot of this bruxism problem myself in, uh, mm -hmm. in practice. So I was uh, really enthralled to read uh, what you put together, the paper that you published uh, last year mm -hmm. on, on this topic. Uh, a, a very uh, rare piece of paper, which is very helpful for practitioners who come across this problem. So thank you for doing that. Um, and uh, I also had a chance to look at your presentation, which I was uh, very pleased to see. Uh, it was very helpful, resonates with uh, some of my uh, practical questions that I might have when I see a patient like that. So okay. let me start with um, um, asking you uh, a very uh, straightforward question um, dealing with this topic. What is Bruxism? And how is this relevant to psychiatry? So thank you, Dr. Palaniapan, for very, very nice introduction. So uh, let's start with bruxism first. So bruxism is mainly, in layman's term, is the jaw contraction, uh, but happening more often than usual. And this can present as either somebody's jaw clenching a lot or grinding of their teeth. And mostly if you look at the literature, a bruxism is mainly of two types. It's okay. either sleep bruxism, which is only happening at sleep, or awake bruxism, which is happening also during daytime. And uh, I feel that this is very, very important topic, clinically relevant topic for every physician who prescribes antidepressant, or I should say any serotonergic medication so this not only applies to psychiatry, but also to internal medicine, family medicine, and our sleep medicine physician, and also dentist. I'll talk about that. Why is that relevant in a few minutes? But this is what bruxism is um, in a very brief uh, terms. That's a very helpful introduction, uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, the point that you mentioned, it's not just psychiatrists who needs to know it because antidepressants are being used by many other practitioners now, as you, as you say. So thank you for highlighting that. Uh, my next question is, um, is something that's uh, really an uh, interesting question for me because often uh, my knowledge becomes a blur over time. But if I understand the mechanism behind uh, an issue, I, try to, I, try, I tend to retain it for longer. So I'm just going to ask you this question. How do you think antidepressants uh, cause bruxism? Now that is, I think, the most difficult and most important question for everyone who prescribes these medications. So when I published this uh, literature review, I looked at almost every case report and case mm -hmm. series published on this. Mm -hmm. And almost every article gave this one hypothesis in mechanism. 
So basic theory is that medications that increases serotonin, they causes hyperactivity in the serotonergic neuron. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that serotonergic neuron going from raphe nucleus to ventral tegmental area, this hyperactivity in serotonergic neuron causes indirect hypoactivity in the mesocortical pathway, oh. which runs from ventral tegmental area to our prefrontal cortex and thereby to the masticatory muscle and various other areas. Right. So basic theory is serotonergic medication, hyperactivity, indirectly reducing the activity in the mesocortical pathway and causing bruxism. And this is one of the main reason why one of the medication that we will talk in the treatment section moving forward, Buspiron, is helpful in that area. I will talk more about that moving forward. But this is a very, sure. very uh, hypothesized mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. Why antidepressants do that? Okay, that's helpful. So if a patient comes to me and asks me, why am, am I having this problem? I should invoke the serotonergic hypothesis to explain that. Makes that's, sense. Uh, fantastic, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, so uh, I, have, I have another question, which is uh, you know, very practically relevant for me. I mean, you, you mentioned a mechanism, you mentioned uh, it's important for us to know but could we have some sort of rank in our mind, which antidepressant causes more bruxism risk and which one is a little safer in practice? Yeah, that, and, and Linda, this is very important question again. I think this is the question that every psychiatrist, every physician asks mm -hmm. when they encounter this issue, can I change medication or which medication is more risky or less risky? And that was the reason why we did this literature review to begin with. And the answer is not ideal. So what I will do is I'm going to share a few slides sure. uh, so that it uh, is more easy for everyone to understand. Okay. So this is a paper that we published uh, in 2019, our uh, literature review. So let's rank these medications in various classes. So what happened is, Lena, we looked at many, many our case articles and mm -hmm. total we found 46 published case reports on that. Wow. You can see here, out of that, 34 were related to SSRIs, which is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And out of those, fluoxetine was rank one, followed by sertraline. But I have mentioned this in the paper also that I assume the fluoxetine is high because that was the oldest antidepressant, yes. the first one that came into market. Yes. But again, uh, when you look at SSRI, uh, fluoxetine, sertraline, and acetalopram. They were very high, but I was able to find almost every SSRI causing this um, bruxism as a side effect. And when you look at SNRI class, mm -hmm. which is selective nor norepin uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, mm -hmm. uh, they only, we only found venlafaxine and duloxetine as the co most common causes. But out of these 11 cases, nine were related to venlafaxine. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, and this was actually uh, like a surprise for me, yeah. which mm -hmm. is bupropion, which, is, which have mostly no effect on the serotonin reuptake. We found one case of that. Mm -hmm. My thinking was bupropion is very safe because it should not cause that hyperactivity of the serotonergic neuron. Yes. But this stud, uh, case was published for bupropion SR formulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, looking at other medications like mirtazapine and trazodone, mm -hmm. I was not able to find any articles on that. And, and as you can see, the literature review was published last year in 2019. So before this presentation, what I did was I also looked at maybe there is some new studies published after that. I found a positive study for mirtazapine. Actually, there was a case published uh, a patient with cerebral glioblastoma. Uh, mm -hmm. He developed bruxism and they chose mirtazapine and bruxism resolved. Mm -hmm. So mirtazapine is one of the better medication in my opinion. Right. And in a few minutes, I will talk about treatment planning for bruxism mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trazodone is one of the treatment there. We'll talk more about it. Sure. So yeah. mirtazapine, trazodone makes sense. Yes. And then tricyclic antidepressant and MAOIs. I was not able to find any articles on that. And when I talk about treatment planning, I will just uh, talk very briefly about my personal experience sure. with tricyclic antidepressants. I have found them actually helpful in few of mm -hmm. my patients with bruxism 
but right. we'll talk about them in a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. Let me go back to our video. Okay. Sure. Thank, thank you for that visual. I'm, I'm a very visual person. I like to, you know, see things so I can remember Same better. So I, can now, yeah, I can now remember the, the SSRIs, especially the more commonly used ones have very well, higher propensity. Doxid and Sertraline, Escitalopram, as well as SNRIs, Venlafaxin and Doxid. Uh, uh, so it looks like, uh, you know, anything that blocks the reuptake of serotonin uh, would have an effect to, uh, you know, increase the chances. But when it comes to antagonists like mirtazapine, trazodone, they don't seem to have the same uh, same issue. Exactly. Uh, that's a very healthy. So friends, this marks the end of our first part of this Coffee Club video discussion on antidepressants induced bruxism. In our second video, we will f talk about topic number four, which is who is at high risk of getting bruxism with antidepressant use. And the last and I think most important and clinically relevant topic is how can we manage bruxism with antidepressant use? And we'll talk about various treatment strategies. And the whole section is available in our coffee club. And coffee club uh, is a new feature for physician's guide for clinical psychiatry course. So if you're interested in um, watching all our coffee club videos and other features, please consider subscribing to our course. I will put the uh, link below. And with this course, you get access to um, 250 plus clinically relevant chapters. This coffee club and also journal club. And there are many more features that you can find by clicking on the link below. So friends, thank you again for watching. We will see you in the second part of this video in our coffee club section. Thank you. Bye.